All right, how's that? Is that good? Yeah. All right. Um, so somebody's in charge of the sound, so um, I, I assume that you, everybody, you can hear all right. If, if, um, if you can't, tell, just tell me uh, so I can. What, a little louder? Just a little louder. Just a little bit. Okay. All right. So, um, so I've got a lot of material here, and I, um, um, I have changed, I've given this talk several times, but I've changed it every time, and I've changed it most drastically for tonight. Uh, so, um, and, and I haven't had a chance to run through it in this format before. So um, just bear with me just a second. And just, in fact, I just realized I need to get my notes out. description of this talk uh, before we really dive into it. Um, this is a talk about machine learning, uh, which is a which is becoming a very uh, ubiquitous aspect of our of our lives. It affects us every day in ways that we may realize or that we may not realize. Um, and it's becoming a subject that we cannot ignore, especially as technologists. Um, when people think about um, uh, and I'm just talking about machine learning primarily tonight, but machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. And when people talk about artificial intelligence, uh, I think we all kind of realize that this has the potential to be something pretty big. But how big? Is this going to be like the internet? You know, is it going to affect us in so, you know, as much as the internet has? Well, actually, the people who have studied this and have thought about it say, no, it's more like electricity. It's going to be that big. Because, uh, because artificial intelligence is a general purpose technology. So it's like electricity or the steam engine or the internal combustion engine. And you think about, just think about that last one, how much that's transformed how we live. I mean, suburbs would not exist if it wasn't for automobiles. Uh, and so if artificial intelligence is, has the potential to be that big, it's something that I think we uh, even if we're not going to become practitioners of machine learning, it's something we should we should probably take some time to understand a little bit about how it works and and uh, think about some of the the upsides and downsides of it. So th today I'm going to focus on just a subset of, of artificial intelligence called machine learning, um, and uh, and I have to I have to tell you up front this is a mathematical subject, so there will be some math. Um, I'm um, you don't need a math background to, to understand tonight's talk, but I think you probably will need some math if, it, if, if this is a subject that you want to pursue in more detail. And I'll give you some pointers on on how to uh, on, on, on areas of math that you could brush up on if you want to do that. Um, and this is the part where I um, usually I'm giving this talk at conferences, and um, and this is the part where I also tell people if you think you might be in the wrong talk, you should you know. Feel free to get a, choose a second choice and you know sit near the exit and leave. And, and the same thing for tonight, even though you don't have another session to go to. Um, if this, you know, it won't hurt my feelings if if you need to bail out early. Uh, so uh, I want to tell you just a little bit about myself uh, first. Uh, my name is David Body. I'm an independent software developer. I am very interested in data science and machine learning, and I would like to, I haven't figured out how yet, but I would like to do, get more involved professionally with those subjects and, and uh, get figure out a way to get paid to do some of this really interesting work. Um, I also love teaching and learning, uh, which is why I'm here tonight. Um, and, and very importantly, I am available for contracting consulting work. Uh, so uh, if there's anything I can help you out with, I'm a general I'm a I'm kind of a web developer primarily. I do a lot of Ruby on Rails, but I've worked with a lot of other technologies, and I'm much more interested in the uh, what the project is about than the specific technologies involved. Because I I I learn new technologies quickly, um, and I've used a lot of different ones. So 
Anyway, I wanted to ask a little bit about you. And we saw, we had a little survey earlier when I was setting up my computer, and I didn't catch, I didn't catch all the details of that. Uh, but I assume a lot of people here are software developers. How many are you, of you are software developers? Okay, most people. Do we have anybody who would call themselves a data scientist or a statistician or something in that that kind of one who hesitates to hold up his hand? You can, def you can definitely raise your hand high. Uh, no, I know that feeling because when you start calling yourself a data scientist, you know, I've tried it out. I've called myself that a couple times. It seemed to work. <laughs> um, and I assume there may be some others. Were there students? Is that what? But several students back here. Where where are you students at? William Penn. William Penn. Okay. And studying what subjects? Computer science. What? Computer science. Everybody, computer science. Uh, software engineering and maybe IT. Okay. Sim similar types of things, but not not. Um, not specifically data science or statistics or something like that. Okay. Um, I usually assume that there might be somebody in the audience who knows more about this subject than I do because I'm not an expert. Uh, so if I make any mistakes um, or if there's something that you'd like to clarify, just jump in, okay? Just raise your hand or shout it out. Um, and and I, we are recording this, right? So, so I'm going to try to I'm going to try to remember that I need to repeat things that you say because because you guys don't have mics. Um, so anyway, um, before we dive in, I wanted to show you this tweet that I that I uh, remember meant a lot to me when I first saw it. Because this is um, uh, this is if you're new to deep learning, and deep learning is just a is a subset of machine learning. In fact, I had that on that first slide, and I will tell you what deep learning is later in the talk, and I I think you'll be disappointed when you find out. But it sounds cool. Um, but anyway, it's a it's a um, it's a pretty daunting um, subject to try to get into because it involves so many different things, and there's a fair amount of math, and there's a, there's computer programming, and there's probability, and, and all kinds of stuff. But th but this tweet says each part you need to learn is learnable, and nobody knows it all. So just keep that in mind. So here's what we're going to talk about tonight. I hope we can get through all of it. Um, usually I have a firm ending time and I usually don't get through this so I'm, I'm going to try to go faster in the earlier parts um, so that we can get we can spend more time on the interesting stuff at the end but anyway we're going to talk about the concept of machine learning uh, talk about some types of machine learning just get some terminology down then we're going to look at three specific machine learning techniques uh, linear regression which may or may not actually be machine learning depending on how you look at it but it fits the definition um, logistic regression for classification, and then neural networks. And we will go through an example um, in Python of basically image recognition using handwritten um, digits. So the digits 0, 1, 2, 3 through 9, um, we have a data set with um, handwritten versions of those. We're going to train a neural network to recognize which digit is which. And then we'll talk a little bit, I hope we have time to talk a little bit about some of the things that, that potential dangers of machine learning and artificial intelligence, and I'll give you some pointers for where to get more information. So, so what is machine learning? That's, that's the title of the talk tonight, right? Machine learning allows computers to learn or improve their decisions or predictions without being explicitly programmed. So the idea here is that instead of writing a program to solve a problem, we will write a program to that can learn how to solve a problem. Does that make sense? And it'll become more um, concrete as we as we go through the material tonight. So here's a here's a diagram from a, from a book that uh, is still still in beta. It's not published yet, but it's from it's Deep Learning with Python. Um, it's a Manning book, um, but. But it shows, and I don't know, you, it may be hard to read in the, in the far back, um, but this, the top part says classical programming is in the box. And, it's, and in classical programming, we, our inputs are rules, so that would be the code that we write, and data, which we know what data is, right? We feed those into 
um, into the computer an outcome of answers, right? Because we wrote we wrote software to to take that data and produce answers. With machine learning, a way to think about it is that what we're feeding in, and of course we're feeding, we've got a program in there too, but what we're feeding in is data and the answers. So in the case of like those handwritten digits, we're feeding in the handwritten digits, but we're also telling our system what each one is so that it can learn to recognize them. And so what, out, what comes out of that process is a set of rules for recognizing digits or for whatever, whatever task it is that we're trying to train our, our uh, system to, to know about. Does that make sense? Okay, I want to get, just talk just a little bit about terminology. You may have heard terms like the supervised versus unsupervised learning. Um, um, we're, tonight, we're only going to be talking about supervised learning, but let me explain what that means. Um, so with supervised learning, we are going to, we're going to have a set of examples where we, where we know what the correct output is for each example. So if we were if we were doing image recognition, um, there's an online there's an online competition a site called Kaggle that was recently acquired by Google, but where you can people compete with each other with algorithms. And one of the one of the kind of example competitions they had is recognizing cats or dogs. So you have, you have you're shown, you're given images, and the question is, is this a cat or is this a dog? And with supervised learning, we tell, we know somebody has gone through. A human being has looked at these and, and labeled each picture. Um, um, in a course, in an online course that I took, one of our assignments we dealt with um, um, fit, uh, fitness tracker data. Uh, it wasn't Fitbit, but it was some other fitness tracker. They didn't say what. It was this was early on in in. in uh, in that technology, but what we had was raw, uh, like accelerometer readings from these fitness trackers. But, w but each example was labeled, so we knew whether the individual was standing, sitting, uh, walking, running, going upstairs or going downstairs. I think those were the basic categories. And then our assignment was to was to develop an algorithm that could take uh, unlabeled examples and predict what um, what they were. And that was actually the homework. This is what you submitted was they gave you 20 unlabeled examples and you had to submit 20, 20 answers and you were graded on that. Um, turned out it wasn't that hard. It sounded, it sounded pretty hard when I first saw what, what, it, what the assignment was. Um, now, co contrast that with unsupervised learning where we don't know, we don't have labels. We, don't, we can't tell the system what this is that we're looking at. And in those cases, we're doing something more like, um, like grouping. Like maybe we have data on a bunch of customers, and we want to we want to group them into groups. So that's a, that's a technique that's sometimes called cluster analysis or clustering. And we don't we, we just have some some definition of of what it means for two data two examples to be near each other or some measure of distance, and then we let the algorithm create these groups and then we could go back later and look at these groups and have a human look at them and try to maybe decide, give them names after the fact. But the but the computer, the algorithm was able to just was to be able to create those groups without any labels. Or another situation where you might have un, unsupervised learning is where you're doing some kind of system health monitoring. So like a complex software system and you're monitoring it or you're monitoring your hardware and software. Um, and you don't necessarily have examples where things have gone wrong. You just want to know if something out of the ordinary happens. Um, and um, because there may be things that go wrong that have never gone wrong before. So you don't have data to, to train on to say, well, this is what this particular type of failure looks like. And then there's a third, <coughs> a third kind of learning that I want to just mention because a lot of times when people read about artificial intelligence in the news, um, you're learning about things like autonomous vehicles or, or um, uh, systems that can play games like chess or Go. Um, th those systems are much, much more complex uh, because they depend on 
the system making a series of decisions in advance before you find out whether those were good decisions or not. So in order to win a game of chess, you're going to, the system's going to have to make a bunch of different moves, and you won't find out until the end whether you won or not. And so how do you know if you're making good moves? And so that's a much more complicated system, but that's called reinforcement learning. Um, and like I said, tonight we're only going to talk about supervised learning. We're only going to talk about it in kind of fairly simple terms. So far so good? OK. So types of machine learning problems, these are still kind of terminology, but we're getting into these are the things that we're actually going to look at in more detail uh, tonight. So first, regression. Um, this is where we are wanting to um, uh, forecast or predict a, a value. Um, so for example, we may have data on houses, like the number of square feet, the, uh, the age of the house, the number of bedrooms, the number of bathrooms, um, you, you name it, you know, stuff like that. And what we want to do is, is use that to uh, predict what the, what the selling price of the house would be. Um, or maybe we have an example we'll look at in a few minutes. We have some information about, about cars, and including the weight and the, uh, the number of cylinders in the engine and things like that. And we want to predict what the fuel efficiency Contrast that with classification, where we are, where we were wanting to decide whether something belongs to a certain class. So, is this a cat or is this a dog? Um, is this, you know, is, is this handwritten digit? Is this a five or a six? Or, or, you know, we know it's one of these things, and we have to decide which. Uh, so that's another thing that we will look at. Um, and I already mentioned clustering. We're not going to look at that tonight, um, but that's another type of machine learning problem. So now, specific techniques. Um, the first one we're going to look at is linear regression. Um, um, I hope we can go through this fairly quickly. I'll, I'll wait and take a show of hands in a little bit over how many people are, are, are comfortable with that. Um, then we'll look at logistic regression for classification. And then finally, we'll look at neural networks. And that's the cool part. That's, the part, that's why I want to go fast uh, in the earlier stuff so that we can get to that. So I'm ready to talk about linear regression. And I just had to throw this tweet in here because I personally go back and forth on whether I consider linear regression to even be machine learning. Um, but it, it, technically it is, and it's a good way, I guess, to introduce the other topics. But this tweet says, by today's definition, y equals mx plus b is an artificial intelligence bot that can tell you where a line is going. Uh, so yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's it feels a little silly um, to talk about linear regression like this, but, but let's do it. Uh, so, how many people how many people know what linear regression is? The basic concept. So, all, most hands are going up. Okay. Um, big, and I'm, I'm going to go through it, but I'm going to go through it fairly quickly. So, what we have is um, a, a set of data points. In this case, we just have x, y pairs. So, you can imagine. Uh, y on the vertical axis. You could imagine that that's the price of a home, and you could imagine, ignore the scales if that's what you want, if that's what you're doing. But you could imagine that on the horizontal axis is the uh, is the number of square feet, and so you would expect that the more square feet a home has, the higher the price would be. And so we plot this data, those blue points, and our and our task is to find a line. It's just a, a straight line that somehow best fits that data. And I and I this this notation, I, my equation there says y equals b plus w times x. That's maybe a little bit unconventional if you've studied linear regression, but I'm adopting kind of the machine learning um, notation where uh, we talk about weights and biases. And it's still silly to call that a weight and a bias, but. Um, now we are, our notation will stay consistent when we get into the other things. So, so what we're going to do here is we want to figure out, we're given the x and y values, and we want to figure out the best, the best value for b and w, uh, given the data that we have. And so to do that, and this is going to be a pattern that we follow with all types of machine learning, at least the ones we talk about tonight. First thing we have to do is select a loss function. 
we have to, we, we have to um, in, in supervised learning, where we know what the answer is, um, we, the techniques are based on, on reducing errors. So we're going to have some concept of what it, what it means to make an error, and then we're going to have a loss function that's, that's uh, trying to reduce the size of those errors. Um, and then we're going to select a minimization algorithm, and then we're going to use that algorithm to find values for B and W that minimize our loss function. And that's pretty abstract. I, I'll, make it, I'll make it more concrete now. But does that make sense, the, kind of the broad concept? <coughs> okay. So in, our, in this case, our loss function is going to be the sum of the squared errors. Um, and I haven't told you what the error is yet. But the loss function is a function of our two parameters, B and W. And we could, for this purpose, we consider our data, our x and y values, to be fixed. Um, and so, for, so, um, so what does it mean? What does an error mean? Well, what it means is um, we are going to um, take, we're going to take, we're going to guess a value for B and a value for W, okay? And then we're going to, uh, that's going to describe some straight line, right? Um, it may be way off, it may be nothing like the line that, um, that, we, that we end up with, um, but we will calculate a value of Y from that formula. So we'll take B plus W times X and we'll calculate a value for Y, that's our, that's where our line predicts y should be for that value of x. And then we'll subtract the actual value of y from our, in our data, and that will be our error for that, for that example, uh, for that particular house, let's say. And we'll square that. Um, it's, and I won't, I, I won't go into why we square it. There's lots of deep reasons why this works out. To, squaring these errors works out to be a, a, a pretty smart thing to do. But one thing it does is it, it stops positive and negative errors from canceling out. They add, they'll add up because they'll all become positive uh, once they're squared. <clears throat> so if we go back and look at this line, those errors are, uh, you know, pick any value of x for which we have a blue dot. The, the, uh, for, for, specific values of B and W, we could, we could find a point on that red line uh, for that value of X, and then we take the blue dot that corresponds to that value of X, and we, the vertical distance between the line and that dot is our error, so it's just the line minus the dot, so, so it could be positive or negative, and then we square that and we add it up for every dot, for every point in our data. And, what we're, and then what we want to do is find the values for B and W that make that sum as small as possible. So far, so good? So, um, so how do we minimize that loss function? This is the part I'm going to completely skip tonight, okay? Various algorithms. <laughs> um, um, in the case of linear regression, actually, we don't even need an algorithm. We can, we, we have formulas, we could go directly to the best answer in one step. But in general, in machine learning, what we're going to do is some kind of iterative process where we're gonna try some values, then we're gonna figure out what how they should be changed, change them a little bit, try the new values, and keep on going until we can't until we can't improve anymore. But those values for WB that minimize that loss function are our estimates or B and W, and then when uh, we get a new value of X, we can, uh, we can predict what Y is going to be from our formula. Make sense? So here's a concrete example. Um, this is a data set that comes with the R language. I apologize for not translating these into Python, uh, but this is the way the talk was already put together. Uh, there will be Python later. Um, but, um, uh, the, um, for now, the variables that I want to concentrate on are the MPGs. That, so this is a data set of 32 automobiles that was, that was from a 1974 issue of Motor Trend Magazine. This kind of, I don't know, it's kind of a standard example for linear regression um, in a lot of places. But the variables I want to focus on, we have MPG, which is the left uh, after the names of the vehicles there, and then WT, which is a weight. That's in thousands of pounds. 
Um, and those other variables are like the number of cylinders, the displacement, horsepower. I don't remember what draft is. Um, I think like AM, I think that's whether it's automatic or manual transmission. Um, it doesn't really matter for, for tonight. Um, but if we, if we run that linear regression, and, and I'm using R again here, and I realize this is kind of small on the screen, but um, the estimates we get for B and W are right here. So we, we, R tells us that, um, that B, the best value of B for this data set is 37.3 roughly, and the best value for W is negative 5.3. And so if we, if we take those values and, and plot that data from that data set that I just showed you, um, this, is what, this is what the data looks like and this is what that line looks like. It's a negative slope because as the vehicle becomes heavier, the fuel efficiency is, is reduced, generally speaking. Um, and notice that, that um, and this is a, something I want to point out as we go through this, right now, um, those parameters are, are pretty interpretable. We can just look at them, and um, and this is this is telling us that if we had a vehicle, and this is, I realize this is kind of silly, but if we had a vehicle that weighed zero, um, our model tells us it should get about 37 miles per gallon, and this is from 1974, so that's pretty good, I think, even for a vehicle that weighs zero. Um, but then, as we as 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 if we make a vehicle a thousand pounds heavier. Um, we are generally speaking going to lose about 5.3 miles per gallon every thousand pounds that we add um, in weight. So we're just we can look at those at those parameters that we've estimated and just directly interpret them. We'll see a theme as we go through other examples tonight. As we get into more complex machine learning algorithms, it becomes more and more difficult to interpret anything. Now, typically, um, I just I threw this in here too. Typically, we're not going to just limit ourselves to one explanatory um, variable. We are here. What I've done here is I've taken that same data set and I ran the regression with miles per gallon against all of the other variables in the data set. Um, and you can see that we now our intercept has now flipped from uh, has now changed from 37 to 12. Um, and our, our coefficient on weight has dropped in magnitude down to minus 3.7. It's still negative, but it's, it's not as negative as it was. And you can see there, there are values for these other variables too. Uh, uh, the only one that's statistically significant is weight, it turns out. But that doesn't mean the others don't, don't improve the model. All right, so that's it for linear regression. I'm gonna move on now but we're going to build on this. So are there any questions so far? OK. Everybody's so quiet. I, I, I hope that's a good sign. It's not always a good sign. So let's talk about binary classification. There's, there's different kinds of classification. Um, but let's talk about the simplest classification where we are just trying to put something into one of two groups. Um, so for example, um, is this email spam or not spam, um, or a medical diagnosis. Does a patient have a, a particular disease or condition, uh, yes or no? Um, or in marketing, we always, is this customer, will this customer make a purchase? Or, or more, probably, uh, probably more common, uh, will this customer click on an ad, click on this specific ad? Um, uh, or is a manufactured item defective based on some some data we have about it. So these are yes, no questions. And so we could imagine, let's imagine a situation where we have a single explanatory variable x. So similar to our, our linear regression model, and now our y values are either one if the example is a member of whatever class we're looking at, or it's a zero otherwise. So for example, here's, some, here's a plot of some data where um, um, x is the number of hours that a student spent studying for an exam, and y is whether the student passed the exam or not. So we have, a, we have data here for several different students. We have hours studying horizontally, 
And then we've, we've on this plot, we've, we've got y is either a zero or a one. So the ones that are a zero means the student did not pass the exam, where y is one, then that means the student did pass the exam. So what we really want to do is kind of calculate, have our model calculate what's the probability that a student will pass the exam. And um, probabilities have to be between zero and one. So linear regression doesn't work in a situation like this. It doesn't, I mean, you could use it, but it's, it, it's not going to work very well because you're going, it's going to be possible to get probabilities that are less than zero or greater than one, and that, that's not allowed. I suppose you could just um, do this and then just say, well, once I hit zero, we can just make this line just go straight this way. We can, we can cut this off at one and do something like that. But it's still, um, there's something we can do better than that. So what we need to do is take, we need to take the variable that we're predicting and squish it down so that, we, so that we're, we're guaranteed that it's between zero and one. And so we do that with something called this sigmoid or logistic function, uh, which is just shown up there at the top. It's one over one plus e to the minus z. I just arbitrarily chose z as the argument for the for the function. Um, um, you know, like if, like if this was a uh, software function, that's just the parameter name. It could be. It's just it's arbitrary. Okay. But it turns out that depending on <coughs> you, this function can take in, z can range from negative infinity to positive infinity, but the function will always be between zero and one. And, you, and I've plotted it here. Um, uh, that's just from minus 10 to 10. So you see a, um, the, all the action here is kind of in the around zero. From minus five to five is where most of the action is. So what we could do, if we wanted to build a model to uh, predict whether someone will pass an exam or not based on the number of hours they study, if we could take we could take that a, a, a linear equation similar to what we had before, uh, where we have b plus w times hours. B and w are parameters that we're going to try to learn from our data, and calculate a calculate a value z that we plug into this sigmoid function. And that will give us a value between 0 and 1. So if we do that for this data and run, you know, run the logistic regression uh, software, it, gives us, it tells us that our estimate of b is about minus 4 and w is about 1.5. And I plotted that here uh, uh, using the, the sigmoid function. And you can see it does a fairly decent job of giving you some probabilities here. If you spent two hours studying, this is saying you have about a 25% chance of passing the exam. But if you spent four hours studying, you have probably, it's kind of hard to read, but probably a close to 90% chance of passing. And of course, the more hours you study, the, the higher your probability gets, but it never reaches 100%. And uh, the less you study, the lower the probability gets, but it never goes all the way to zero. So does that make sense? Now, we are, logistic regression is a statistical technique. We're kind of, um, I don't know what the right word is, we're uh, perverting it. Isn't that, that's too strong. But we're, we're using it, what we're going to use it for is just classification. So we're going to, what we're going to do, instead of sticking with that probability is we're going to pick a cutoff point, probably 0.5 by default, and just say um, if, if, this, if, we, if, if we predict your probability of passing the exam is 0.5 or greater, then we're just going to say this guy's going to pass. Um, and if it's less than that, we'll say, we're going to say this guy's not going to pass. So we, we're, we're, we have to make it, we have to make, we have to classify um, each example one way or the other. And um, so we're, we have to pick a cutoff point, and, and unless there's a good reason to pick something else, we'll just pick 0.5. So for example, let's suppose we have another example. Let's suppose we have um, a database of email messages that are, that are labeled as spam or not spam. Um, and our variables, now instead of having just one variable, let's say we have 50 
uh, we have relative frequencies of 50 common words and punctuation marks. Uh, now, I assure you, real spam filters don't work like this. They're much more sophisticated. <laughs> but, um, but we're going to use a logistic regression where um, we'll, we'll set our Y to be one if the message is spam and zero otherwise. And then once we've once we've we've run our model and we've got we've got our um, uh, we've calculated our weights and biases, so we've calculated all the parameters on on those various um, explanatory variables. Then we can take some some new email messages that we haven't seen before and try to predict whether they will be uh, spam or not. And when we do that. Um, we can get we we can, find, we can do this to measure how well we're doing, and we can generate something that we call a confusion matrix. So, and this will come up later in our in our more complicated example. But across the top, we have what we're predicting, so false or true, and on and, and vertically, we have what's actually the case, false or true. So, that top left corner. We're saying that we're in this made-up example. We have 264 emails that we said were not spam, and we were right. Okay, those are those were true negatives. And down, and similarly down here in the bottom right, there are 158 emails that we said are spam, and we were right about those. So those are true positives. Now the ones that we got wrong, there's two ways we can be wrong, right? We could um, we have a false positive, of which we had 14. So that's a case where we said this is spam, but it really isn't. Or we could have false negatives, where we said this email is not spam, but it really was spam. And we have 22 of those. So that's, this is a kind of diagnostic tool that we can use in classification problems just to kind of see how we're doing. And you can think about the trade-offs, like how in real world problems, false positives and false negatives are problems, but email de spam detection is one thing. What if this is a medical diagnosis? Or what if this is fraud detection on a credit card transaction? You really kind of want to think about it case by case. What what do you think the trade-offs are for, uh, for, get, for being wrong in various directions? And who's affected by that? And that's a, by the way, that's a terrible spam filter. I go crazy. My spam number wasn't any more accurate than that. All right. So far, so good. Are we ready for the the, the real meat here? Let's see how we're doing. Okay. All right. So neural networks. Um, so let's start with um, um, something called a perceptron, and we're not. We don't actually use perceptrons in modern neural networks, but this was an idea that goes all the way back to the 1950s. And I think the original idea was that they planned to implement this in hardware. I don't know if they actually did, but that was the, that was the original thinking. Of course, we would do it in software today. But what, what's going on here is we have this unit, this kind of black box, or I guess it's a white circle, I guess, here on the screen. Um, um, and we're feeding in some data. So we've got, in this case, we've got three values, x1, x2, and x3, that we're feeding into this thing. And it's going to generate a binary output. So it's going to take that data that we give it, and it's either going to output a 1 or a 0. And so how is it going to do that? Well, very, very simply, we're going to just have a set of weights in, in each one of these units. Um, we're going to have a number of weights equal to the number of x values that we are feeding into it. And we're just going to multiply each x value by its corresponding weight and add those up. And then check to see if we are above or below some threshold that we specify. So if we're below, if we're at or below the threshold, we'll output a 0. If we're above the threshold, we'll output a 1. Simple enough, right? So now let's, let's um, let's replace that threshold. Um, this is equivalent, okay? Instead of having the threshold there, I'm going to put in each of these, each of these perceptrons, a bias term, a B. Um, and then we, instead of, then our, we can, by adjusting B, and B can be positive or negative, it can be any value we want. 
But by setting that, we can now make our threshold just be zero. So it's, 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 in some ways, it's a little bit simpler. Um, and then we're going to form a system of these perceptrons where they will we'll have data feeding into some of them, but they will have outputs of perceptrons feeding into as inputs to other ones, and we'll have something that comes out at the other end. And what we want to do is, is figure out the weights and biases for each of these units that these are the things that we're going to learn, these Ws and Bs. So if we combine these things together, um, we, can make, we can make an artificial neural network. So we have, in this case, we have three input units um, that are feeding into, um, in this case, four hidden units. And they're called hidden units because they're not input units and they're not output units. So something, something in between. Um, and, in this, and in this case, this is a, um, this is a fully connected network where every, every unit in the layer below serves as an input to, to every unit in the next layer, right? And it's also a feed-forward only network because the data only flows from left to right. We don't have any, we don't have any place where data is going back and looping through, right? And so, um, see here. So what we are going to do is, um, so these things right now, the way I've described it, these are all, other than the, the inputs can be any values you want, but the other things, the outputs are just going to be zero or one. Um, we're gonna, that's going to be a problem for us, and we're going to fix that. Um, but before we do, let's just think about how we're going to, how we're going to kind of train this thing conceptually. So these outputs, um, I should have come up with a concrete example for what these what these represent. But it, it's, right now it's completely abstract. But we have, but we know we're going to have some training data, and we're going to, and it's labeled. So whatever comes out of those outputs, um, and because there's two of them here in this example, and they can each be zero or one, um, we could imagine there being four different possible combinations, right? So maybe this is a, you know, what we're doing here is classifying something as as one of four different categories. But we, what we can do is um, feed it a bunch of data, uh, calculate, pick some, pick some values for the weights and biases. Um, uh, and remember, there's going to be, because there's three inputs, there's each of those hidden units is going to have three weights plus a bias. Um, and so we need to pick values for all those. We'll calculate what comes out of the network. We'll compare it to what, what, we, what, we, what we know it should be. And then we'll figure out a way to adjust those values and uh, run it again and try to get better and better and better until we've chosen kind of the best values for the weights and biases. So it turns out that perceptrons don't work very well for this in a multi-layer network. Um, and the reason is that when you, because, of, because we're flipping from zero to one, when you, we can make we can, we can easily imagine situations where you make a small change, where you're trying to train a network, you make a small change to just a single weight, and it flips that whole unit from zero to one or vice versa. And uh, that, makes it, that, that makes it problematic for algorithms to try, to try to learn the right values. So does anybody know how we're gonna fix that? Use values between zero and one. Use values between zero and one, exactly. And we're going to do that with a sigmoid function. So what we'll do is we'll take those, um, each of these hidden units is, we'll, we'll calculate, we'll take the inputs, we'll multiply each of them by a, by a weight, add the bias, um, and then we'll run that through the sigmoid function, and that way we'll guarantee that what comes out is always a value between zero and one, but the but the thing that save the thing that makes training easier is that now the, now that value changes gradually instead of just flipping all at once. So inside e inside each one of those circles, um, at least in the hidden and output layers, um, in the, this is what's going on. 
we are taking the, the input that's coming in, the, the inputs that are coming in to that unit, whether they're coming, at, whether they're original data or if they're coming from other units earlier in our network, and we're multiplying each of those inputs by a weight, and we're adding a bias to get it, and we're, so we're calculating this intermediate value z that we then plug into the sigmoid function. And that gives us a nice value between 0 and 1 that can become the input for the next layer, or it could actually be our output. We're going to tweak that. We're going to do something slightly different on the outputs, but I'll get to that in a minute. So the basic idea is um, we're going to start off, we've got our data. We're going to start off by just randomly choosing values for the weights and biases. We're going to run our network forward with those values that we've chosen randomly, see what our output is, calculate a loss function, um, and then do something clever to figure out how, and I, this is, I don't have, I, we can't, it's beyond the scope of tonight to explain what that is. We're going to figure out how we should change each of those weights and biases by a little bit to make our answer better. And, um, and, then we'll, and then we'll go through, we'll make those changes, we'll run it again, we'll see, we'll see what our loss is, and we'll just keep repeating that uh, many, many times until, we, until we're satisfied. So now I'm ready to show you a concrete example. So this is, the, this is kind of like the hello world of machine learning. Uh, uh, this is a, a famous example, MNIST, um, NIST is the National Institute of Standards and Technologies, I think, that's approximately right. Um, and I think M stands for, this is a data set that came from NIST and somebody modified it. And so I think the M stands for modified. Um, uh, I'm not 100% sure, but what it is, what this data consists of is 70,000 examples of handwritten digits. And so for each example, we have a 28 by 28 grayscale, 28 by 28 pixel grayscale image. Um, and then we have a label indicating which digit this actually is. So is this 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. So in other words, you can think of this as this data as um, consisting of 70,000 rows. So each row is an example. And then uh, we, have, we have columns. We have the digit label, which is Y in our case, which is 0 through 9. And then we have X1 through uh, X784, because 28 by 28, 28 times 28 is 784. Um, those are the pixel values for that example. And those, are, those pixel values, in this data, we have them encoded as floating point numbers between 0 and 1. So given those values, so given the set of this, you know, those x values, we want to predict what digit this is. Now, one way we could do this uh, is just using logistic regression. We could, we could set up, we could do 10 separate logistic regressions. So we could do, the first logistic regression would just be to say, is this a zero or something else? So a zero or not a zero. Um, so we could, we could encode our y then to be one if, this, if the example is a zero, and we could have y be zero otherwise. And then we could just repeat that 10 times. And that's, we can do better than that, but that's not completely crazy. I mean, that, that, that's actually called uh, one versus rest or one against all classification. But what we're going to do is um, use a neural network. And um, it's going to be, I know this diagram looks complicated, but this is a relatively simple neural network. Um, we have an input layer, which um, I don't know how many units you see there, but that's really, on the left, that should be 784 little circles, because that's our, that's our input layer. So we have 784 x values coming in for each example. So I just imagine that being vastly, vastly bigger. And then each one of those is going to feed into 15 hidden units. Uh, and 
15 is just, we just chose that arbitrarily. That's one of, one of the decisions you have to make when you're setting up a neural network. You, you've got to decide some things like, well, how many, how many hidden units should I have? How many layers should I have? Because tonight we're only going to look at two-layer neural networks, but you can have an arbitrary number of layers, and so there could be dozens or hundreds. Or I, I, don't know what the, I don't know what the record is. Um, uh, but what we're, what, basically what we're going to do is feed, and this is densely connected and it's feed forward. Um, so all of those inputs go into those hidden units. Those hidden units compute values between 0 and 1. Those feed into these 10 output units. Um, and we have an output unit for each of the 10 digits. Um, uh, so the top one is for zero, the next one's for one, two, etc. And um, we're going to use a we're going to use a sigmoid function for the activation function on the hidden units. On the output units, we're going to do something else, something slightly different. We're going to kind of do the multivariable equivalent of it. We're going to use something called softmax, which is going to we're, basically what we want to do is take advantage of the fact that we know it has to be just one of these. And so we're essentially we're going to force our output to be a probability distribution. So we're going to, those are still going to be values between 0 and 1, but they're going to add up to 1. So we're basically, we're going to kind of place our bets on, uh, you know, we're going to say kind of how sure we are, our network is, that we're looking at, at, at a specific digit. Does that make sense? <clears throat> Okay, so now we're going to look at some code. Can you read that? I realize there, it's, there's sun on it, but there's a screen in the back, too, if, uh, if that's closer for you. Um, uh, oh, I'm just going to step through this, this um, Jupyter notebook. Um, the, the software that I'm using here is um, uh, TensorFlow, which is a library from Google, and then a, a relatively new kind of wrapper on top of that called Keras, um, K-E-R-A-S. And that is, now, that is now kind of part of TensorFlow. It comes with it. But Keras is this simplified um, wrapper that can support multiple different backends. So it can, it can, it can, your backend for doing the machine learning could be TensorFlow, or it could be, or it could be other libraries. I'm not sure how many are supported. There's at least two that are supported right now. Uh, but the idea is that it could um, it could support any number of backends. Um, okay, so now I need to see if I can figure out how to execute this with still and still hold the mic. All right, so I'm executing that first block, which is just importing a bunch of modules, and it takes a few seconds because there's a lot going on there apparently when uh, when TensorFlow loads up. Um, and then it turns out that um, um, the MNIST data, TensorFlow and Keras actually come with some sample data. And so conveniently, um, MNIST is, is included with TensorFlow. Um, and that line of code there will, the first time you run it, it will actually download the data and store it in whatever directory you specify. And then after that, it'll just reread it from that, from that directory. Now, um, we, they have broken this data down into three sets. Uh, a training set, a validation set, and a test set. And I wish we had time to go into more detail about why, we, why this is a good idea to do. But, but what we're, what we're going to do is try to train our network on one set of data and then test it on some data that we haven't seen, that, the, that the wasn't seen during the training. And that's to, that's to guard against Problem called overfitting, where um, networks can essentially memorize their training data and be and be 100% accurate on it, and then just be terrible on anything they haven't already anything else they haven't seen. So they don't generalize well, and so this is a way of of kind of guarding against that. And there are a bunch of other techniques for that too that we won't be able to get to tonight. So I just want to show you. Let me just do these next three cells. This is what the this is what the I'm just printing out the shapes here of these of these data sets. So our training data has 55,000 rows. Um, 
And the X values, the images, have 784 uh, columns. So those are the, the pixel values. And then our Y data, we've actually done something slightly different than I said before. We were using something called one-hot encoding. So for each Y, we, uh, we actually have 10, we, we, you can think of each Y as being an array of 10 values where we where so so if you imagine those being zero through nine, you know, each of those represents a digit. So if if this example is a zero, then the first element will be a one and the others will be zeros. If this if this first if this example, the specific example we're looking at is a five, then that means the sixth element will be a one because we're because it's we've got to account for zero at the beginning and all of the other values will be zero. Um, and that, that turns out that that's convenient because the output of our network is going to be this, it's going to also be 10 elements, right? It's going to be those 10 probabilities uh, for, for each uh, digit. And, so, and then we have this validation data. Uh, I'll explain in just a minute what we're going to use that for. But it's 5,000 examples, same shape. And then we have our test data that we're going to hold out completely what we're doing training. Um, and and um, it has 10,000 examples. And so when we're all done training our network, we will test it. We will, we will test it against this test data that was not used in training. So here's where here's where we're actually going to configure the neural network. And Keras makes this so simple. Um, um, this is it's been cons compared to it's like the Ruby on Rails of of uh, machine learning, and now anybody can do it. You don't have to know what you're doing, and, and, uh, and everything like that. So you know that that's probably great, I guess. Uh, but anyway, um, there's quite a large API involved here, even in this simplified world. Um, but what we're going to do is first we're going to create a model, and this is going to be a sequential model, which just means that it, we're flowing from we're, fl we're flowing from left to right. Our data flows through sequentially left to right. Um, we're going to add um, a layer of hidden units, 15 hidden units. We just specify that. And we're calling these dense because, because they're fully connected. Um, and we're specifying the, the, uh, the activation unit is sigmoid. And for this first layer, we have to tell it what, what type of input to expect. And so our input shape is 28. It's 784, that's what we're telling it, to expect 784 uh, input values. And then our last layer is, is um, also dense, meaning it's going to receive inputs from all of the layers, or all of the units in the layer below it. Um, it's got 10 units, and for our activation, we're going to use soft packs, which I explained before, so that we, basically so that we'll get a probability distribution out instead of separate Basically, we're just imposing the constraint that the, that the um, probabilities have to add up to one. So I just executed that. S executing things like that doesn't, it just sets everything up. Nothing actually happens until we, until we tell it to go. So next we have to specify our loss function and, um, and, and what algorithm we want to use to optimize it. Um, so we do that here. Um, we're, we're choosing for our optimizer something called RMS crop, uh, which I can't explain to you tonight um, um, what that's doing. But one of the things we have to pass to it, and one of the things you have to you have to specify for most machine learning models is a learning rate, which is kind of how fast, how much do you want to tweak the parameters on each step, and that's something you may have to experiment with because if you set it too low, it can take a long time to train your network. If you set it too high, though, the parameters jump by more than they should, and you end up like overshooting and kind of zigzagging around trying to find the optimal um, values. But we also have to specify here, and that, what that RMS prop does is it, it actually can adapt the learning rate for each of the parameters. Uh, and we're going to see here in a minute there's a lot of parameters. Uh, we also specify the loss function, which is categorical across entropy. Um, 
don't worry what that means right now. Um, and then we're and then we're telling um, Tim, we're telling Keras to keep track of accuracy so that we can get that back out at the end. So now we can we can call this uh, summary method here, and we get some output just kind of showing the structure of our of our network. And I told you there were a lot of parameters. There's that, there's in, just in that hidden layer alone, there's 11,775 parameters. Think about that. So let's just walk through how we get that. So how many parameters are in the first hidden unit? There's 784 um, data points coming into it, right? So in the very first hidden unit, how many weights will there be? There's going to be one for every x, right? So there's going to be 784 weights plus a bias. So if you've got a calculator handy, you can check this. You can, you know, basically we've got 15 hidden units times 784 plus another 15. Each hidden unit has a bias, so plus 15, right? That should be 11,775. And then the output unit, the output layer. So take think about the first unit in the output layer. It's getting input from 15 units in the hidden layer, right? So how many weights does it have? It's going to have it's going to have 16 was the, was the answer, but it's going to have 15 weights and a plus a bias, right? So so each each output unit is going to have 16 parameters. So that's how we get 160. So total parameters is, is close to 12,000. This is actually pretty small, uh, but this seems, if you're used to just things like linear regression, this seems, this seems incredibly big. All right, we're ready. We're ready to actually train the network. Um, and so to do that, we're calling model.fit. We're passing in the training images, the training labels. We're specifying the number of epochs so an epic is going to be one full pass through the data. So we have, we've got, remember, we've got 55,000 training examples. And so we're going to make 20 passes through all of that. Um, I'm setting verbose equals 2. I don't remember what that means, but if, if that's what, that will control the output that we get here. And then we're specifying batch size and validation data. Um, it turns out when you do this, instead of to save time, um, computer time, uh, each step of the way, each time we run that network forward and calculate our loss, we're going to choose. We're just going to take a subsample. We're going to take 512 examples instead of all 55,000, and do that calculation, and then um, use those to cal use those values to calculate how we want to update the parameters for the next pass. And in the next pass, we're going to choose a different set of 512 examples. And we're going to keep doing that until we've gone through all 55,000 examples 20 times. And then, yes? How is the loss measured? How is the loss measured? Yeah. So um, we're specifying, we specified a loss, we've specified this categorical cross entropy loss function. And that is a, that's a con entropy and cross entropy are concepts from information theory, which is a, a weak area for me, but it has to do with how similar or different two probability distributions are in this in this uh, set in this set. Um, so it, it's a way of taking is a, the output for each example is going to be a set of ten values, right, zero through between zero and one, and they're going to add up to one. And the true value of y is just going to be a one for whatever actual digit it is, and so we're going, we're, we're doing something to calculate how close we were, and then adjust for that. So then the other thing that we're going to do here is we've got that set of 5,000 validation examples that we're also going to pass into the training, and so at the end of each, I think it's just at the end of each epic. We're going to calculate our loss function and our and our accuracy on those validation examples. 
Um, so it's kind of like test data that's not really being used to train the model, but we, but we are going to use it in training because we're going to use that data to tweak things like, like our learning rate or our batch size or our number of hidden units or our number of layers and things like that. And so we really want to keep, we, we need a little bit of data like that that we're not really training on, uh, but we want to keep our test data completely separate and not, not use that at all until the very end. All right, so here we go. I'm going to kick this off. It runs fairly quickly on my laptop here. Each, one, each row there is an epoch, so that's a full pass through all 55,000 examples, and we're done. Um, and now let's take a look at how at what we got out of this. Uh, first of all, I'm just going to do a couple of quick plots. Uh, this is our accuracy on the validation data plotted against epics. So you can see we're starting off, well, we actually started off around 77%, almost right off the bat, but we're, we got ourselves up above 90% there. Um, here's our actual, here's our loss function on the validation data. You can see that's going down. Uh, it looks like it might go even lower if we, if we ran it a little longer. Um, but now let's actually, now let's actually look at how accurate we are. So we're now we're run, now we're calculating our accuracy on the test data, and we're nine, almost ninety three percent accurate, right? That's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah. No, you're right. The guy shaking his head in the back is completely right. This is embarrassingly bad. <laughs> um, this is a really simple um, network that we set up, and if we did a few things, just a few things. Uh, differently, we could get this up over 99% um, without that much effort. But it would take a, it would take a long time to explain some of the things we have to do in order to accomplish that. All right, so now let's let's take a look at some of those actual calculated probabilities. I'm going to just this code. It basically is going to calculate. Just I just ran it, and it calculated the predicted values for all of the test examples, and it also calculated our probability distributions for all of those. Store them in, in variables so that we can uh, look at them. Um, here's some diagnostic measures that we can use. This is called a classification report. Um, I'm going to skip this for now. This is calculating some things, some statistics called precision and recall uh, that have to do with um, percentages of false positives and false negatives comparing different ways. Let me skip that for now. Um, and just and, cal and, com and compute the confusion matrix. So here's our confusion matrix. And of course, this is 10 by 10 now, instead of 2 by 2. Um, and I, I think it's the case that the predicted are across the top of the actual or, or uh, up and down. But I, we have to look at the documentation to be sure. Um, I used the, um, the confusion matrix function from from uh, scikit-learn. But anyway, so if we, if we did a perfect job, we would have, our numbers on the diagonals would all be, well, the diagonal would all be high, and we'd have zeros everywhere else, right? So that very first, that 958, that's the number of zeros that we got correct in the test set. Um, uh, and so you can look by, you know, by looking at this, you can kind of see what types of mistakes we're making. You know, are we, um, so what are we doing? It looks like we're confusing nines and twos a little bit. Um, but let's, instead of just looking at this, let's actually, um, let's actually just compute a list of all the errors that we make in the test data. So that um, in this run, there were 707. And by the way, you're going to get slightly different numbers every time you run this because the initial weights and biases, um, well, we're letting Keras do it, so I have to look up how it's doing it. But we're, we're, I think what it's probably doing is initializing the weights randomly and probably setting all the biases to zero because that's kind of a typical thing to do. Uh, but because we're starting off in a random location and we're just running for a fixed 
number of iterations, we're going we're to end up in a slightly different place each time. I've got a couple of utility functions here that just plot. Just, uh, I'm just going to skip over those right now and just actually uh, run this. So, I, so this next bit of code I'm going to run is going to sample five of the errors that we made at random and, and then call this review function. And what that does is it's going to, it's going to plot the, the example and then uh, give us a little bit of information about it. So this example um, is actually a seven. Um, <laughs> we, our network predicted that this was a good one. And you can see here's our probabilities. So we actually said there was a 73% chance that that's a nine. Uh, but, we, but there was a 14% chance that it was a seven. So that looked like our, that looked like our second choice this example. All right, this one, it, we thought that was a two, um, but it's actually a six. Um, and it looks like we, we were 73% sure that that was a two. Um, and what's this, let's see. Is this six? You can count better than I can. So, we, so it looks like the correct answer was our second choice again here. Um, all right, this one looks like we messed up a little worse. That's a five. Obviously, that's a five. We thought that was an eight for some reason. Uh, now, remember, the way we're doing this, we are, we are really just treating each pixel on its own, right? Those, things, those pixels are just fed in. And so um, we're, we're, saying, we're predicting this is an eight because a lot of the pixels that, 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 that are marked here are similar to pixels that are marked when it's actually an eight, right? We're not, take, we're not taking advantage of any kind of knowledge that these pixels are in a certain relationship to each other and that they form shapes or anything like that. Uh, so it's not quite so surprising that we're, that we're making these kinds of mistakes. But the, cause the ones that we're missing are, are like this one. Uh, so without looking, I'll cover that up. You, maybe you've already looked. What, what, no, what do you think that is? That's, it's actually an eight. Um, we predicted it was a five. Um, I look at that, I can't even tell. I can't tell what that is. It's in a really, really small <laughs> circle of box. Yeah. Um, now this, here we, we messed up that on this one. This, we said this was a two. We said this was an eight. Um, but it's actually a two. But if you think about it, why did we think? Why did we think it was an eight? Well, it it has a lot. There's a most of an eight there. If we just had another diagonal line, we'd have the whole eight, right? So our network is not very smart, um, uh, but we can kind of see how it works. So, any questions about this? I'm going to go back to my slides then. All right, so what did we leave out? Uh, we left out a lot. Um, <laughs> um, I talked just a little bit about overfitting, um, and I don't think I mentioned the word regularization, but one of the things you have to guard against is, um, is, having, is training so that you get super accurate on your training data, but then you can't, you can't generalize you make bad predictions on data that you haven't already seen. And there's a whole, whole bunch of different techniques that we use to fight against that. For example, one of the things you can do, um, and this makes more sense when you have more layers in your network, but you can use something called dropout, where um, at each layer, you randomly select a few units to just exclude. Just, they just don't have any input for the next layer. Um, and that way, if those that way, if those units are you don't become you don't become overly dependent on on specific units to learn specific things about your data. It makes your whole network more robust. There's a whole bunch of other techniques that you can use uh, for that as well. Um, in when we're doing re image recognition, and we're serious about it. We're going to use something called convolutional neural networks where we take advantage of the fact that we know that this is a rectangular grid and that there, that there might be shapes there. So we're going to have, we're going to take 
um, I can't possibly just describe this tonight. But we're going to take uh, small, um, we have to decide how big to make these, but just a few pixels square. And imagine running that, having a unit that was based on, say, a three by three set of pixels, and then running that on every place we can and throughout the whole image. And then what might happen is we might learn to detect like edges that way. Um, so we can start to detect uh, that this, this looks like it's an it looks like a diagonal edge of something, or this is a this is a horizontal or vertical line, or this is a curve with a certain configuration. And then the, the units that learn those things feed into other units, which then start assembling those and, and generalizing shapes from those. And that way you can start doing, you can start doing, a, you can get much better at recognizing digits, but you can start doing facial recognition and things like that too. Or a whole, a whole other kind of problem is when you have sequential data. So for example, if you have, if you're doing natural language processing um, or um, uh, speech recognition, or something where the data that's coming in is ordered, and you want you want to be able to take advantage of the fact that uh, you kind of want to remember what's come before because it provides context for what you're what you're seeing now. Uh, and so there's a whole class of networks called recurrent that, that deal with uh, processing sequential data and and uh, and worrying about how we remember things and and then also how we forget things. You know, once you once you finish translating a sentence, maybe you kind of want to forget. You want to forget uh, some stuff that you, some context that you learned for that sentence and start translating a new sentence. And there's there's much much more. Uh, I, w I want there's a few things that I want you to keep in mind. Uh, first of all, uh, machine learning is susceptible to bias. So the examples we've looked at tonight is probably not so much of a problem. But if you're using machine learning to evaluate resumes, or um, uh, it's becoming kind of a popular thing to decide who's eligible for parole, um, or who qualifies for a loan, uh, things like that. Um, if there are biases in the data that you're training on, those biases are going to show up in, in the um, in the output of the of the network. Oh, and I forgot to mention, back when we did that, we didn't look at any of the specific weights and biases. But you know, we talked about whether they're interpretable or not. These are <laughs> these are not going to be very interpretable, right? So that's my next point. Uh, machine learning is hard to interpret. It's also hard to explain to somebody, even though we saw what we did there tonight and we all understand what we just did. Could any of us explain why we you know we could guess at why we thought that two was an eight, but there are other ones where we're we're not going to have an explanation. And uh, and then on top of that, if we use it in ways that affect people's lives, and, we, and we've got all of this stuff going on, that makes it potentially dangerous. Um, and I know there are people who there are some people who are kind of raising alarm bells about artificial intelligence and. I don't know, they have these apocalyptic scenarios where robots take over the world or something like that. I don't think that is our, I don't think that's our, anything we should be worried about. And, uh, somebody compared that to be, to uh, worrying about overpopulation of Mars. It's like, yes, this is a theoretical possibility for a long time in the future, but it is not our, is not anywhere on our current list of problems. These, these kinds of, having bias, and having these opaque uh, algorithms that are that are deciding who gets into college, um, that's a much more serious um, thing to, to be worried about, I think. Which is why I want to recommend this book. Uh, this is called Weapons of Math Destruction by Kathy O'Neill. And I, I follow her on Twitter, and she tweeted this morning that, it, that as of today, it's available in paperback. Um, uh, but basically, she describes uh, wep a weapon of math destruction, a WOD, is an algorithm that is opaque, that operates at scale, 
and that can damage people's lives. So some of the things that we just talked about. She's, there's, this is a, uh, there's no, she's a PhD mathematician, but there's not a single equation in this book. It's just, uh, it's, there's a chapter on each of these different um, scenarios. So there's a, there's a chapter about teacher evaluations where teachers were fired based on some algorithm. Uh, there's a chapter on uh, insurance, I think, and on loan origination. And so I, it's been a while since I've read the book, but that's the, that's the type of book it is. And it's, it's really worth reading. Even if you're, even if you're not going to do anything else with machine learning, it's just worth reading to be informed about things that are going on in the world right now. Now, if you really do want to learn machine learning, um, there is some math involved, way more math than, than we saw tonight. Um, but the, the, you can learn this as you go if you don't already have a background in it. Um, and I'm going to point you to a couple of, of other resources here in a minute. But you, you, eventually, you're going to have to learn some basic calculus, some, uh, some linear algebra, uh, probability and statistics, and even a little bit of information theory, uh, which is something I'm working on right now. Uh, um, but um, you can learn these as you go. Just remember, you can learn these as you go, and no one knows everything. Uh, I don't think you have to get multiple PhDs or anything like that to, to, uh, to be successful with this. So I'm gonna, here are some, a few books. Um, um, Gosh, I put these up here long enough ago. I don't even know if these are the exact same books I would recommend right now. But um, that book over there on the left is called Deep Learning. And it's probably the most popular just kind of textbook type style treatment of, of machine learning right now. Uh, oh, and I promised I would tell you what deep learning is, and I, and I did. Uh, deep learning is when you have a neural network with more than two layers. So. Sorry, <laughs> if, you thought it was, if you thought it was going to be something more interesting than that. Uh, it just happens, for some reason that term just, just people like it, it's like good marketing or something. You know? It's just, uh, it's a brand. Um, so anyway, this book is called Deep Learning. It's really about, it's really about machine learning and neural networks. Now, and it does kind of assume knowledge of those math subjects that I just mentioned. Uh, but a slightly easier one is Introduction to Statistical Learning. That's the yellow one here. Um, or there's a bunch of Manning books. Um, this one is Algorithms of the Intelligent Web. I think it's a lot less mathy uh, than some of the others. Um, and then there's a, just a ton of stuff that's, that's just online. There's a book by, I call it a book. It's a website called neuralnetworksanddeeplearning.com by Michael Nielsen. And it's a, it is a online book, but you have to read it online because it's interactive. And so as, you, as he, he walks you through a lot of the same material that I went through tonight, but as you encounter like sigmoid functions and things like that, you can actually play with, you can actually change the parameters and see how the shape changes. Um, and he, walk, he walks through building up neural networks and show, kind of gives you visual proofs that um, it turns out that uh, that a neural network with at least one hidden layer can learn an arbitrary function of its inputs. It, now, it's going to have to have either multiple layers or it's going to have to have a lot of units in order to do that. But by, by just adding units or adding layers, you can become, you can learn arbitrary functions arbitrarily, uh, you can arbitrarily closely approximate them. Um, and it kind of walks you through it a visual, intuitive proof of that. Now, the next website is fast.ai. This is taking the approach that you shouldn't have to learn math before you start doing this. You should start off, just start off coding. Um, they're going to teach you how to drive the car, and you're going to learn how to use the steering wheel and the brakes and everything, but they're, but they're going to tell you about what, how it works later. Contrast that with a lot of the courses on Coursera, where you're going to learn how to build the engine, and then you're going to assemble it, and um, you're going to make a transmission and hook that all up, and then at the end, you're going to be able to drive this car. Um, so depending on how you want to approach it, those are kind of the two different approaches, but 
I haven't actually taken the courses on fast.ai, uh, but they're free and, and, it, and it's a code first approach and then you learn the theory later. Uh, and then Wikipedia just has a ton of information, really excellent material. Um, many, many, many articles on these subjects. Just start searching for uh, whatever. And then one of those will lead to another to another. So, questions? Yes. Is Python the best language for doing AI? Or is someone serious about learning AI, should they be learning something like R? So the question is, is Python the best language for learning AI, or should somebody, should you learn R? Um, I, I don't know. I think, I think you can do, um, you can do this with, with either language or even with other languages. Um, I would say if you already know Python or R, just stick with it until you have a reason to switch. I showed you Python for Keras there, uh, but um, on the R Studio blog, I think it was today, they have an article about the Keras bindings for R. So we could do the same, that same example using the same exact calculation engine, but do it from R just as easily. So um, I don't think it matters. Um, there are, and there are other languages too that I, that I haven't really investigated. My experience has been, well, I started off learning this stuff on Coursera and the first, I thought I was gonna use Python, so I spent some time learning Pandas and then I started taking these courses and they were all taught in R, so I forgot everything I knew about Pandas somewhere along the line. And now I'm taking another, actually there's a new, I forgot to mention this, there's a new deep learning specialization on Coursera that's also taught by Andrew Ng, that's uh, NG is his last name. Um, and he's the guy that has compared AI to electricity. And he's one of the founders of Coursera and former chief scientist at Baidu, which is the Chinese search engine. And he's, I think he works also works at Google Brain He's just an all-around really smart guy and a really excellent teacher. And this, this I've just finished the first course in this five-course specialization. It's extremely well done, and it's all it's all in Python, uh, but it's all just using NumPy. So you so you have to be walk, he walks you through implementing logistic regression and and a five ultimately a five-layer neural network. You have to write it all. You have to write all the code. Um, and it's a great great way to and the big, the big finale is you can classify whether a picture is of a cat or not. <laughs> <laughs> and only with about 80% accuracy. So, any other questions? Yeah. So you ran the examples on your on your laptop there. So it's like, what's the, the hardware specs you're looking at? Well, obviously, you don't want like a $20 Walmart computer, but do you need a $5,000 know, top-end business machine? Um, I think, it, so the question is, what kind of hardware do you need to do this? And it, and it just, it depends. For do it for learning it, you can you could use anything. The, the examples don't take that long to run. Um, if they do take a long time to run, it's probably because you made a mistake and you, you need to fix your algorithm. Um, but for doing serious machine learning, then you then you want to start. You're going to need lots of RAM. You may want to use GPUs. Um, a lot of that stuff is available online, you know, in the cloud. Um, and there, and Amazon and Google and a lot of different cloud providers have machine learning images already set up to go. So if you if you want to if you want something with TensorFlow, they're probably lots of images to choose from that, are, that have everything already set up for you. Um, I have seen, this is a big, I mean, this is a big debate. It's, uh, uh, I'm using a laptop here. This is a, this is a brand new uh, ThinkPad. Uh, I don't, it's not super fast, but it's like 2.8 gigahertz, something like that. I don't even know if, that, if that's what matters anymore. It's quad, four cores. And, it's a little bit faster than my five-year-old MacBook Pro, uh, but it runs this stuff plenty faster. I've seen also people blogging about using a Chromebook 
from doing all of this and then just doing everything in the cloud. So uh, uh, it's, it, I think ultimately the answer to that depends on more on um, do you want to spend the money up front to buy hardware or do you want to spend it um, on EC2 and, and spend it in the long run? Other questions? I, I should mention too, for people that are just interested in these kinds of topics, there's enough. There's an R user group in town that um, doesn't meet. Um, it doesn't meet on a regular. Um, it doesn't meet on a regular schedule um, in person, um, but we had been having these. Every Saturday morning, uh, we've been having these study groups that meet at a Panera, and those just dropped off the meetup group because I think the guy who set those up originally set them up for a year and the year ran out. Um, so I, I expect to see those come back again, but there are occasionally in-person meetings too like this, typically at the Johnston Public Library, but it's the Central Iowa R Users Group, and, um, and it's on meetup. And the Saturday morning sessions were advertised as R and Python study groups. But I'll tell you, it's a lot more than that. It's just whatever anybody wants to talk about. So, and people come and go. So even though it's scheduled for like three or four hours or something like that, people just, just pop in and out. So, well, that's all I've got. Thank you for coming. And I'm really glad to see a big turnout. Thank you, David. That was cool. So.